Thank you, Erin. Erin's humble. She was a great student. Uh. And the, the thing that so impressed me, Erin, as I got to know her, was not only that she was good in the schoolwork, but that she was just a, a wonderful and warm human being. And I'm so glad that you've uh, had a flourishing pastoral life and have been a part of this church. And it's really good to be with. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to all of you. Um, I speak in many different contexts these days in my work, and I'm glad to do that. But when I get to be with a Peace USA group, it sort of feels like home because it is home. Uh, I, uh, I'm glad to be here with you and this Presbytery. When I was in Texas, I was in Mission Presbytery. Any of you ever been in Mission Presbytery? Yeah. Um, it is literally the size of Kansas. I mean, literally. It's in Texas, but if you figure that it's the size of Kansas. So uh, driving, you know, all the way from Pasadena out here was nothing like having been in Mission Presbytery. So anyway, so good to be with you on, and a beautiful day. It is a little cool in here, but... I, I've never seen so much snow on Saddleback, and I've spent most of my life in Southern California. Uh, in fact, let me uh, share a little bit of just my own background. Aaron mentioned it, but so you can kind of see. Let's see how that goes. Oh, well, yes. Don't you love it when the technology works? Uh, yeah, I grew up at the First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood. We were living in Glendale, but... Uh, my family visited when I was in first grade at First Press Hollywood and loved the church and they had a great children's ministry, so I grew up there. Uh, just a, a wonderful background and, and growing into the faith. Um, I left that church and went east for college and then for graduate school. And in those days, I sort of had my, um, my rebellious uh, Christian pilgrimage. Now, I didn't like leave the faith, but I did worship in a Assembly of God church in a Catholic church, and in a Mennonite home fellowship, <laughs> which is a pretty broad range, right, in the Christian tradition, uh, until I came back then after school and began again working at, uh, at First Press Hollywood uh, on the staff there. And then, as Aaron said, 16 years in Irvine, that's the church in the center there, which has an interesting story. Uh, I don't have time to talk about it. It's, it, it continues on, but in, in some different ways. When I was, a, a, during my time, full-time at Irvine, I did a, a good bit of teaching, both for Fuller and for San Francisco Theological Seminary, which is pictured over there. I, I didn't do much up north, did a lot down here in Southern California, which was a great opportunity and experience. And then, as Aaron said, went to Lady Lodge. It's a little hard to see that, but this is a, it's a gorgeous retreat center on, on a river in the hill country of Texas. Uh, during that time, I was... Just a church member. I mean, not officially, because I was in the presbytery, but I functioned just as an ordinary member of a church, which was really very interesting after having been a pastor. And a, and a really good experience at St. Mark Presbyterian Church in Bernie, Texas. Uh, and now have come back and I'm working uh, full-time at Fuller for the Max Dupree Center for Leadership. Uh, I do some teaching. I do a, a, a D-Min course, cohort, and a few things. But most of my work with the Dupree Center is outward facing, if you will. Uh, there you can see our, our mission statement. Fuller's Max Dupree Center for Leadership exists to serve marketplace leaders so they might live intentionally, wisely, and abundantly as disciples of Jesus in every part of life, including their daily work. So for the most part, we're focusing on people who are out doing their daily work in the wider marketplace. That includes both paid and unpaid work. Uh, we do quite a bit with churches, though, because we want to help strengthen churches to do the work of vocational discipleship and to help folks really get what it is to live their faith in every part of life, especially within the workplace. Uh, much of what we do is online. Those are just a couple of uh, shots from our website. We have lots of resources online. You can find them if you're interested at Dupree.org. Um, we make them available without cost. So you're more than welcome. And I'll say a little bit more about a little bit of that later. So, what I'm hoping you will take away today is, first of all, new ways of thinking about your church. Now, my guess is some of what I share today will not be new to some of you, and that's fine. It'll reinforce things you've already known, things we've been talking about. My hope is a little bit of it might be new and challenging in some ways. But number one, I really want to help you think somewhat new and differently about your church, and what that might mean. Second, the takeaway I hope you come away with is new strategies and examples for leading your church 
to matter in today's world. That it will be both, uh, you might say, theological or theoretical, and then in many ways very practical and strategic. So there's some things you can take back and, and begin to put into practice. Uh, and we may very well get more into those in the Q&A time that follows the presentation. And we'll see where that goes. But that's really my hope and my goal for us today. The, uh, the title of this is Sent, Gathered, and Dispatched, Churches That Matter in Today's World. And I think we know that it is, uh, today's world is a challenging place. There are many tough challenges for the church. Uh, I, I think we all know them. We live in them. We live in a day in which people are less and less inclined to go to church. People are less and less inclined to have a positive view of church. Even though people in the U.S. and especially younger folk tend to still have some interest in spirituality, they're not at all very favorable about the church, makes it harder. People's lives are fuller and fuller. During my period of time working at Irvine, I really saw that shift from a time in which Sunday morning was pretty much left alone I remember when people, parents would start coming to me and said, you know, we're not going to be in church for a while because of tennis. Our kid is on the tennis team or, or whatever. And, and all of a sudden, there was so much more competition. Uh, we, we live in a world in which people are bombarded with information through all of life, but especially social media. And, and so we are in a competitive and challenging space that we have really not been in before in the church in just this way. At the same time uh, uh, that there are many tough challenges, I think there are many rich opportunities. With the challenge comes the opportunity to ask again what it is to be the people of God in today's world. What does God want for our churches? How can we be more authentically the people that God wants us to be? And the challenges actually force us sometimes out of our ruts. They disrupt us, as is often said, and make us think in new ways. And in that, there's opportunity for God to do a new work among us. I really believe that. I see it as I get around to different churches. And so I really believe there are rich opportunities for the church that is sent, gathered, and dispatched. So let's jump in. I, the, the outline basically is real simple. We do sent, we do gathered, we do dispatched, and then we'll have Q&A. So that's where we're headed. First off, the church sent. That actually is a picture of First Press Hollywood, where I grew up and where I still attend, actually. And I use this because you've got sort of the backdrop of the Hollywood sign. So you get the, the sense that this church is in this place of, of great need and opportunity. The church sent. A couple of scripture texts that help us uh, grasp uh, what this is and are reminded of our, uh, a reminder of our sentness. First Matthew 28. Uh, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So this, of course, was initially given just to the few disciples of Jesus. But this notion that we have a responsibility that's to go, uh, although as some of you know, in, in the Greek, this is actually a participle. As you go, make disciples. The focus is on making disciples. But there is this um, sending peace that not only was given to the first disciples of Jesus, but that we've inherited it uh, as well. John 20, 21 and 22, Jesus said again to his disciples, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. One of the fascinating things in some of these sending texts in scripture is how Trinitarian they are. How, how um, clearly and um, interestingly Trinitarian. We're to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One of the strongest Trinitarian texts in Scripture. In John 20, Jesus, the Son, is saying the Father sent me, and then he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. Uh, there, there's much more that could be said about this than I can say now. But this notion of our sending connects us into the very nature of who God is, the triune God. And God's own mission on this earth. Another sending text in Acts. 
When they had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Again, another one of these uh, Trinitarian passages that, that communicates that the people of God are to be sent and out to represent Jesus, to live and proclaim the kingdom to the very ends of the earth. The notion of the church sent is one that we, uh, for many of us, we've sort of lived into and sort of not, in the sense that many of our churches, and certainly our denomination, has been a sending, we've been sending institutions, we've been missionary churches, in the sense that we have helped to send people to the ends of the earth. Growing up in my church in Hollywood, we had many, many partners in mission, and we would hear about them. They'd come back, and they'd tell their stories, and we'd pray for them and support them financially, and we were a, a sending and, you might say, supporting church. We had that vision. That's a little different, though, from what it is to be a sent church, not that it is in any way wrong to be a sending church. We should especially given all that God has entrusted to us, we should be sending and giving and moving outward. But the key difference is that we need also to see that we are sent. That we are not just a missionary church, but a missional church. Now, I expect many of you have heard the language of missional church before. It's been a very influential in many places in our denominations. One of the most uh, uh, um, visionary thinkers about missional church is Daryl Guter, who was uh, at Princeton Seminary for many years, dean of the faculty there, uh, has done some great, great work. Oh, I forgot. I got to keep remembering to do this. Okay. Uh, sorry. There. And it, 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 the point is that we are not only to be, you might say, a... Um, a base for sending, but we ourselves have been sent, if you think about this theologically. <laughs> this church is in this place because God has sent some people here, actually quite a long time ago, as I was just learning. Uh, and, and with that sending comes an essential uh, dynamic, an essential reality, an ethos of being uh, sent, being missional. The word missio, uh, uh, the Latin word is a, a version of the, the verb to send. To be missional is to be sent. Sent on God's mission. In uh, the book, The Missional Church, actually edited by Daryl Guter, uh, it says this, mission is not something the church does. A, a part of its total program. No, the church's essence is missional. For the calling and sending action of God forms its identity. Mission is founded on the mission of God in the world rather than the church's effort to extend itself. So that we, if we are to be the church that God intends us to be in scripture, we'll be essentially a missional people, a people understanding that we are sent by God for God's purposes in the world. We've been sent to wherever we are. To be God's kingdom people in that place. Uh, I think one of the most exciting things that has happened in thinking about the church, especially in the last 25 years, has been this growth of a, what's called a missional theology. To see everything we do as not just for ourselves, not even just for um, directed at God as in our worship, but we are wherever we are for the sake of those to whom we have been sent, for those around us, whatever that means. Okay, that's the church sent. Next, the church sent and gathered. You can't see this picture too clearly, but this is actually my congregation in, at Irvine on my last Sunday. I figured, you know, I want to take a picture of all you folks, so I did that very thing. And that was one of our services. We had four services back then. So that was one of the, the groups of people gathered. This is the, the gathered people. 
We're a gathered people today. One of the things we do as God's people is we gather. And that too isn't just incidental. It's not just an accident that we gather. But if we're to be the church, we need to be brought together. And we see this again in many places in scripture. And I, I could draw if we had more time from the Old Testament and the notion of the, the people of God and the gathered people of God. There's so much that could be said. But in the simplest way, we see, for example, in Acts, right after the, the Pentecost and in the first inflow of new followers of Jesus, it says, awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. And so we get this sense of the people gathering in more public spaces in the temple, gathering when they break, break bread at home. From the very, very start, believers in Jesus came together and gathered. In 1 Corinthians 14, in a very different context, this is Paul instructing the Corinthians in the proper use of what we call spiritual gifts, gifts, empowerments by the Spirit. He says, so what, what then should be done, my friends, when you come together? Each one has a hymn. When you come together, one of the chief places we exercise our spiritual giftedness is in the gathering of God's people. And when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. You know what's interesting? There's no or in that text. If any of you still know a little bit of Greek, you'll go back and check it. There's no or. The sense was that when the people of God gather, theoretically everybody could have everything. You say, well, that's going to take a long time. Well, they were house churches. And it was a very different sense of gathering in a participatory way. Uh, all things are to be done for building up. As you probably know, the Greek word that we translate as church is the word ekklesia. Uh, you'll sometimes hear this described as, or translated as being called out, and that's kind of a, um, a, a kind of a literalistic way, ek being out, klesia is related to being called. But the G Greek speakers wouldn't have thought, oh, ekklesia means called out. They would have thought ekklesia is a, a, an assembly or a gathering of people. It can be used in a couple of different ways. Uh, you see this actually in Acts 19, which is a story of this, you know, hullabaloo that's happening in, in um, Ephesus. And in the context of that, it, it, the text says, Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, some another, for the assembly, the ecclesia, was in confusion. And most of them did not know why they had come together. So, in other words, just a crowd, a bunch of people gathered, can be called an ecclesia. I actually think... Um, I, I haven't um, actually written on this, but I sometimes think this would be a pretty good um, title for a, a book or at least an article. The Ecclesia was in confusion. Uh, that may be familiar to some of us. Yes, they didn't know why they had come together. <laughs> but here, this isn't the Christians. This is just a bunch of people in Ephesus having a, having a riot, really. And then a little way longer, later, it says in this text, if there is anything further you want to know, this is one of the leaders speaking to the group, it must be settled in the regular assembly, which is actually in Greek, the, the lawful ecclesia. The word ecclesia was most often used to describe the kind of the civic gathering, the gathering of the, the citizens in a given city or community. Uh, and... That's, so, so the point is that the very meaning of church is, is gathering and being brought together. I mean, that's the, the, the literal meaning of the word from which we get church. And so again, uh, you see the church's gathering being so significant. In Hebrews 10, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together. This actually uses the word episynagogue related to the word synagogue. They're not speaking of a Jewish synagogue here, but it's just not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. So that people would be skipping the regular meeting of the people of God is not a new problem, just noting. <laughs> but encouraging one another 
and all the more as you see the day approaching. See, the meeting together is an important, essential dynamic of the life of the church. And then in 1 Corinthians, oh, I already did that one. Well, there you go. Oh, no, the point with this is, again, when you come together. So, time and again, we see that the gathering of the church is an essential element in the life of the church. You know, so what do we do as the gathered church? If you start thinking about it, you'll actually get a very interesting and long list. Now, there's, there's really obvious stuff, and then there's less obvious stuff. There's so much. I, I just spent, I don't know, 10 minutes reflecting on this and came up with a list. This is not the, the full and, and perfect list. This is just stuff I thought up in 10 minutes. What do we do as a church when we gather? Well, we praise God in worship. We use gifts to edify each other. It may not be quite the full participatory model in the big gathering, but hopefully many of us are in smaller groups of other believers where we can use our gifts to build up one another. We pray for each other different ways. We confess our sins to one another and together to God. We do potlucks and we eat. That's actually a really important part of the church. Remember back in Acts, one of the first things they ever did, they broke bread in homes, uh, which by the way, then probably didn't mean communion in the way we think of it, but they, eating together has been a huge part of what we do as uh, the gathered people. Thanks be to God. I actually still love potlucks, you know? Although as a pastor, some of you know this, how many of your pastors, or your pastors or elders mostly, you understand when you're sort of like the person responsible, one of the rules of the potluck is you go last. <laughs> and I cannot tell you how, how you know, well you've, known, you've been to them, like so I've eaten a lot of jello and all the vegetable dishes that people didn't want to eat. But I still love potlucks. <laughs> what do we do? We speak the truth in love. We teach and we learn together. We equip the saints in the context of our gathering. We send out servants into mission work or into other church settings or into uh, works of justice. We preach the gospel and, of course, hear it preached. We pass on the tradition that has been handed on to us from the very beginning. We organize for mission. We feed the hungry. We do acts of justice. We encourage each other. We read scripture. We receive offerings. We pass on news. Right? We fill each other in on stuff. We raise money for mission partners. We perform the sacraments. We have fun. And we could keep going. I mean, we could make a long, long list of the things we do as the gathered church, an essential part of our being together. But there is a question that I have which is that how is our gathering shaped by our mission, by our being sent? Uh, in that we gather as a people who are sent. We gather for our mission, for our sentness. We gather for God's kingdom purposes. We gather for the sake of our neighbors. We gather to make a difference in our community and beyond. And sometimes we, in our gatheredness, have forgotten the sent pieces. And we, we so much enjoy and need and value who we are together that we might forget that we're together, not just for us, but for the sake of our neighbors as well. Uh, when I first came to Irvine Presbyterian Church, we were literally across the street from a high school. And not even a big street, just a little street. Literally, we had, uh, it was like 75 uh, of the high school cars parked on our church property every week. And I'm thinking, this is the most extraordinary opportunity for ministry I've ever seen. I mean, gosh. And when I got there, our high school ministry had 12 people in it. And so I asked some of the folk, like, what's up with this? And what I heard from several parents is, well, we're afraid that if we do too much outreach to the high school then our kids won't get the attention we would like them to get. Now, it's easy to criticize that, but some of you, you say, well, I, I kind of get that, you know? I, I, and I kind of got that, and I was kind of horrified, and I, I was also thinking, okay, so the, their fear, and I get this, is that if my kid isn't connected here and isn't getting, you know, attention, he or she might not be a Christian anymore. I mean, there's a lot of risk there, so I get that fear. But over time, we began to work on a different way of thinking about 
what it meant for us to be sent to that particular place. And I remember one time, one of the women in our church I came up to me, came to me, wanted to meet with me. She said, you know, I have an idea. What would it, what would it be if, because students then could leave campus for lunch hour. What if on Fridays we, we just serve pizza? Like, we'll, we'll get some pizza and we'll sell it really cheap and a drink. And maybe some of the kids would come over and they could be here and we'll just host them. I'm like, well, that's a cool idea. Why don't you ask our high school pastor? Well, he didn't want to do it <laughs> for just, just kind of mind-boggling. So she came back. He didn't want to do it. But, you know, do you think I could do it? And I said, well, yeah, let's talk to the session. But I think, sure, why not try this? And she said, good, I'll recruit some people and we'll do that. So she did, recruited some people, um, got a local pizza place involved to buy the pizzas. And the first week, I think we had like 25 kids come over. Well, that's pretty good. And the next week, we had like 50 kids come over. Wow, that's amazing. And the next week was like 75, and two years in, we had 700 kids coming over. And we, we realized this isn't just for us. We ended up talking to the other churches in town saying, you know, you can send your folk over. This is not bring your youth leaders, bring Young Life. This is, you know, we're, we're happy to, to have any of you here. Had a lot of good volunteers. The pizza place is actually making a little money, but we got such a deal. We're selling the stuff really cheap, and then we made a teeny bit of money that, so that then we could do special things for the kids. So, it's a, so it cost nothing. Had extraordinary influence. I, um, as pastor of the church, I'd be out in, in Irvine and maybe go to a coffee place and new barista or new ca- uh, cashier and and, uh, you know, I'd say, so uh, what, what do you do in life besides working here? Oh, I'm a student at Woodbridge High School. I said, oh, great. I'm actually the pastor at the church across the street. The Jesus Pizza Church? <laughs> That's what they called us. We were the Jesus Pizza Church. I said, oh, your church is so cool. I cannot tell you how many times I heard that. Why did that happen? Really, because one woman was paying attention to what it meant for us to be a sent church, got some others who got into it. Amazing. And as far as I know, they're still doing it. I, uh, I put up a... You can't really see that. It, it, that's just small. That's probably 100 kids. I mean, kids everywhere. And it was an amazing thing. So where do we start if we're going to be a sent church? What, is, what are we going to do? Uh, we've got to know our mission. As people who have been sent by God to bear witness to the gospel, to live it out, to be kingdom people, wherever we are. We need to know our community. And what are the needs and opportunities around us? We need to know our particular giftedness and, and resources. Uh, any church, I don't care how small or struggling, has giftedness, has resources. They may not be financial resources, but you've got them. Um, we need to be seeking God's guidance together, saying, Lord, well, you've sent us here. What for? What can we do? Listening and learning, listening to our community, listening to our neighbors, listening to the people in our church who have ideas. We could easily have not done pizza lunch if I and then our session had not listened, because it would have been kiboshed by the high school pastor. <laughs> Just didn't want the hassle, I think. Um, and so listening experimenting and learning. I, I, I really should put experimenting and failing and learning, right? It's, it's going to happen. Things aren't going to work. Pizza lunch worked. It could have been a flop. We try things. They don't work. We say, okay, what do we have to learn from this? Uh, failing. Oh, I did put failing and failing and learning. We're going to fail, but we need to have the freedom to do that. So where the church sent, the church gathered, and then we are the church dispatched. And if you could see these pictures more clearly, you would see a teacher. That's actually my daughter teaching in an underserved uh, classroom up in Richmond, uh, California. You see folk on the Supreme Court, many of whom are, are believers. You see people in, in Africa actually working. You see a, a conference. You see a, a woman cashier in the Philippines. And you see Jeremy Lin playing basketball. Jeremy Lin is, some of you know, a, a Christian NBA player. Dispatched out into the world. Uh, the word dispatch, you say, where, where, where'd you get that? Well, to dispatch is to relegate to a specific destination or send on specific business. It's also to send off or away with speed as a messenger, telegram, body of troops, etc. Uh, 
It's very similar to scent, but I'm using dispatched here, and it may or may not ultimately work, to convey that the sentness isn't just that God sends a particular church into a particular community, but that God dispatches each of us out into that community. Now, some of you say, well, I, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the scattered church. And you perhaps have heard this. Wait a minute. Sorry. Uh, one more. Yep, there we are. Uh, the, the scattered church. We're gathered and we're scattered. And that, that's fairly a common language. And there's goodness in that language because it reminds us that we are the church not only in here, but we're the church when we're scattered out. The thing that is good about scattered language is it, it talks about the fact that we are individually sent into the places where we are. But if we're going to think scattered, we have to think intentionally. What I find unhappy about scattered is it has this sense of randomness. You know, it's like we gather and then we just scatter. And that misses the point that as we think theologically about who and where we are in the world, it's not just a scattering, it's an intentional sending of individuals into the places that we work and live and serve, etc. And so I'm using dispatched in the end, it may not work. But the point is, it's not the same as the sending of the whole church, though it's an implication of that. And it's... Um, it's very intentional. So wherever you are during the week, wherever you spend most of your time, in a very real sense, you have been dispatched into that place by God as a part of the church. And you are there to do God's kingdom work. Now, we are dispatched for a variety of things. I may not read all of these texts, but we're dispatched for work. The daily work we do is essential to our createdness and our, our, our humanity. You see that in Genesis 1.28 when God says to the man and the woman, first off, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. In Genesis 2, God creates man and then woman as a partner to till and keep the earth. You know, it's so interesting. Before human beings were told to have worship services or build altars or do any of those things, they were first told to work. Work is an essential part of why God has put us in the world. And so we are dispatched for work. We're dispatched for worship. Worship, of course, happens or should happen when we gather together. But also we can continue to worship when we are out into the world. Romans 12.1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This isn't referring mainly to what we do when we're gathered. This is how we are to live in all of life. Ephesians 2.12 speaks of the fact that we who first set our hope on Christ might live, literally it's be, might be for the praise of his glory. We're to walk in the good works which God has prepared beforehand for us, Ephesians 2.10. And so that we're, we're sent out individually into our different places in the world to do the work that we have to do. We're there to worship in that work and in other things we do. And we are dispatched out in, to be witnesses. That we, as we live and speak in a certain way in the places that we have been dispatched then we are bearing witness. Ephesians 3.10 talks about the fact that the church is to um, make known the wisdom of God to the whole cosmos. And we do that certainly when we are gathered together, but we equally do that when we are out in the world. Now this might seem a little controversial, might not. But I really believe that your church's biggest impact is in the dis dispatched mode. If you were to just f have a way to weigh how your church matters, wherever you are, to weigh the difference your church makes, I think you would find that what happens in the dispatched mode is enormous. Doesn't in any way devalue what we do when we are together. Let me be clear about that. So we gather together. So my church in, in Hollywood, uh, we have a really fine 
and, and really wonderful ministry of the homeless who live under the freeway, like right next to the church. And that's a great thing that we do. It's really important. Right on. I'm so glad we're doing it. And it makes a real difference in the lives of many people. At the same time, those who gather, uh, those of our church who gather on Sunday to help feed the homeless, then get done there and go off into the world and spend the next however many hours waking, uh, you know, hundred-ish waking hours, potentially serving the Lord. That's a huge impact. And in all kinds of different ways. I think this is one of the places where we have tended to miss weighing our church's impact and mission and ministry. That we think so much in terms of what we do when we're gathered that we haven't thought nearly as much about the impact we can have when we're scattered. And this is such a, a word of hope in so many ways. Uh, I don't know how it is for you folks here, but I know when I was in Texas, our church was not a very large church. And there are some mega churches in Texas. There's a, I have a friend on the staff of a church in Dallas that has 120 people on its staff. Now, it's easy when you're the little church to m compare yourself to the big church and think, you know, we can't do any of those things, whatever those things are. You know, we can't have any impact in this community. Uh, we can. We can through what we do as we're gathered, but we can, especially when we think about what we can do when we are scattered out. And so, when we think of how is our gathering shaped by our mission? One of the things, and I'm just going to hop down to the last one, given our timing. We gather to equip, encourage, and dispatch one another into our mission in the world. One of the main things we should be doing together is really helping one another, helping all of our people to be able to go out into the world as intentional servants, ministers of Christ, representatives of the kingdom. Yeah, you can, you can get a picture of that. No, no, that's really okay. It's, it's actually a pretty good thing if somebody wants a picture, you know. <laughs> and so, no, that's fine. All right, you get that. Because I'm going to switch in a minute, but I want to wait till you get it. Yeah. Yes. It, we, can, we can absolutely do that. In fact, you even got it. So, I am very happy to have it shared with any of you, you, if you would like that. But it's also fine that you took a picture. Uh, the only time that really bugs me is in weddings. It happens sometimes. I'm sure some of you know that. It's like, you know, we have rules in churches, that we at least tried. You can't come up and take pictures. But increasingly, weddings are done everywhere, right? And we don't do, I mostly don't do church weddings anymore. And you know, relatives are coming up in the service and taking pictures and it just makes me crazy. But that's a different talk. And you didn't ask me to do that talk. Uh, let me, how do we equip our people for their mission as dispatched ministers of Christ in their part of the world? I mean, partly it's laying out the vision for this and the calling to do it. Uh, some may not really think that way about their life. It's been so common for us to divide sort of sacred from secular. So people will even talk about, yeah, I go to church and I'm with my family on the weekend and then I go to the real world, right? And, and it's, it's different out there. Now, in many ways it is different out there. So that's why we've got to do some work together to help prepare people for what happens uh, during the week. Uh, there, there's teaching and training to be done. We can give examples and stories uh, to help our people see uh, the, the examples of others who are really living their faith in every day out there as dispatched people. We can listen and discover with people when they learn what it means to live for Christ in the context of their daily work or their community or the kinds of things they're doing. And we collaborate, we work together on this. This isn't the kind of thing that pastors in particular become the experts of. Because mostly Pastors are living and working within the context of the gathered church, mostly, and that's fine. So I'm not going to be able to tell all of you what it is to live your life out there, but we can collaborate and work on that together.
So there's a, it's a different shaping of what it means actually to be a leader in the church, a pastor, an elder. Uh, there is certainly a teaching and training role, but there's a collaborative and listening and learning together role as well. So just a couple of examples, and then I will be done, and we can have Q&A. Uh, the question of how do we equip people for their mission as dispatch ministers of Christ in their part of the world. Uh, I have a resource for you. It's called Life for Leaders. It's a daily devotional. It's emailed every morning at about 2 in the morning. It's from us, from the Dupree Center. Costs nothing, so I'm not trying to sell you something here. This is uh, just a, a, a tool that might be helpful. Uh, what we do in Life for Leaders is very simple. Uh, we take a, sh a short passage of scripture, reflect on it in some way, uh, paying attention to the text and its implications, kind of like what you would do in a sermon, but really short. Then some questions for reflection, suggestion of something you might actually do, and a short prayer. And that's emailed out every day. We've got like 7,600 people now, I think, who are subscribing to this. Um, one of the things we try to do again and again here is make connections between faith, God, and our daily work. And we don't do that literally every day in the same way because sometimes the text doesn't want to do that. But that's really the point. How can we uh, make disciples for every part of life? And this is one of the things we make available. You can get this either by visiting Dupree.org or you can text the word devotions to the number 66866. I got to say that's a, that's a few sixes too many. It makes me kind of nervous, right? At least we're not texting it to 666. That would be, but anyway, if, what? Well, it works. Yeah, if you text, you, you will get a link and you'll hit the link and it'll take you to how you can sign up. So that's a super easy way to do this. Now, this might be helpful to you. And if it is, great. And if it isn't, you can quit. Real easy. We won't spam you and all, all that. Many of you will also perhaps find that it's helpful in the context of your churches, your ministry. I, I, I know an, a growing number of churches that are kind of adopting this as their thing. I write the majority of them. I write the, devo the devotions Monday to Friday. On the weekend, I have a great team of other writers who uh, also I just are... are diverse, and that's important. So I have uh, a two Asian men and an African-American woman and an African-American man who write, who can bring some of their life and culture into that, which is an important thing. Um, it's free. If it's good, great. But it's one tool, one tool that can help equip our people for being dispatched as ministers of Christ in the world. The other thing I'm going to mention, this is different, but this is something you can do it's becoming increasingly common in churches. It's called This Time Tomorrow. Now, I'm just here. Any of you ever heard of This Time Tomorrow? It's not as well known in, in California yet, but it's coming this way. Uh, this Time Tomorrow is kind of like what we do when the missionary comes home and makes a little presentation in worship. It's very similar to that. I think most of us know that. You know, you support missionary, you have a mission partner or somebody working in a justice mission or whatever. And, and they come to worship and say, you got two minutes, right? And you hope and pray that they actually go two minutes. I had one one time at Irvine, went 17 minutes. And you just are trying to say like, when do we bring out the big hook and yank the missionary out? Well, you really can't do that. So I'm literally sitting there recalculating how I can cut my sermon, given the fact that this is now 15 extra minutes. But... What you do in this time tomorrow is this. And I, yeah, you can actually kind of read that. I took that from the website. Uh, there's an organization in, uh, in London that has kind of piloted this. And it's, but this is what happens. So they say once a month. I know churches that actually do it weekly. Uh, at Hollywood, they're doing it, I think, once a month. You invite somebody from your congregation forward for a little interview. And this is the interview. Where will you be this time tomorrow? Well, I'm, you know, I'm a realtor. I'll probably be, you know, either out in the field or I'll be in my office. Well, I'm a, I'm a mom and I will have just gotten done getting my kids off to school or whatever it is. Where will you be this time tomorrow? What do you do there? Brief description. What are your challenges and joys? Now, that could, of course, be a long thing, but it doesn't have to be because 
mostly you've rehearsed with people. What are your challenges? Well, you know, it's really, t- sometimes in realty, I just talked to somebody who's a realtor. And there's, it's very tempting to exaggerate, she was saying. And it's really hard not to. And, you know, it's easy for us to say, well, you just have to tell the truth. But, you know, you can imagine. That's a challenge for her. What are the joys? The joy of seeing somebody find the right home for them is, is a huge joy. So, share that. And then how can we pray for you? Well, I'd, I could really use some help with the, you know, the, the truthfulness thing and whatever. I mean, people say. Uh, I'm, I'm caring for my mom who is getting older and needs a lot of help. And I just, I'm tired. What some churches do at this point is actually to say, you know, so we're going to pray for, you know, Sally here. Uh, but she works in a bank. Any of you out there who work in finance... If you would like to receive prayer, we'll include you. So if you'd like to stand, we'll just pray for you too. And so then we pray for Sally the banker and the things she has shared. And the whole thing with the prayer, maybe, maybe three or four minutes. Super easy. Costs nothing. Takes a little bit of time. It can be absolutely transformational. I I have heard uh, a, a friend of mine who was... He's been an elder in his church long time. I mean, he, he, he's into his 70s. The first time this happened in church in a field relevant to him, he said, this was the first time in my entire life in church, anything in church actually felt like it spoke to what I do all week. And it was so encouraging to him. Super easy to do. There are other things that w- as well. Maybe we can talk about them. So, the, uh, Aaron mentioned that I did a commentary on Ephesians, and so I think a lot about Ephesians, and there's this one passage out of that that I'm sure many of you love as well. It's just an extraordinary text, and with this I want to end, and then I'll pray, and then we'll do Q&A. It says this, Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Just such an amazing passage. First, the affirmation that God, who by the power at work within us, right? So God's power is within us. And, and in this context in Ephesians, the us isn't just the dispatched us. It's the dispatched and the gathered us. God's power in us when we are together. God's power in us when we're out there is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. So you think, what's the the wildest dream you have for your church? God can do way more than that. What's the wildest dream you have for your life? God can do way more than that. To to him, that is to God, be glory in the church. So the, the sentness and the gatheredness and the dispatchedness is all tied back into God's glory. We are to live or really more literally to be for the praise of God's glory. And when we're focused there, not on our own survival, even not first off about serving people, though that's a great thing, but we're here that God would be glorified in the way we serve. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. So let me pray and then we'll have some Q&A. Gracious God, uh, thank you first off for This morning and for these people who are here because they really care. They care about your church and they care about their churches. And they want to be churches that matter. And they want to see your kingdom uh, reflected in and stretched out into the communities in which they find themselves. Uh, They wouldn't be doing this on a Saturday morning apart from their desire. So I thank you for that and for the the way your spirit has put within them this desire for their churches and for your church and for your glory. Uh, Lord, help us. You know how easy it is for us to get in ruts as we do church together. It's just so easy and it's comfortable. And it's easy to forget our sentness and to focus more on how we can be there for each other and getting our own needs met. That's real common. We all understand that. We need your help to remember that we are put where we have been put 
by you for your purposes and for our neighbors. And so help us. Uh, Lord, in some ways we're really good at the gathering part. And we like the gathering part. But may we also remember that we are gathered not just for ourselves, but for our neighbors and for your mission. And especially we pray that you would help us as we are together to learn how to equip and encourage one another when then we're dispatched out into the world. Individually sent out, scattered out, but not just scattered randomly, scattered intentionally by you and your spirit in places that we can make a difference whether it's just right in the neighborhoods in which we live or the, the stores and shops in which we work, the offices, whether it's in our families, our friendship groups, the teams we coach, the places we volunteer. Lord, uh, we could go on and on. You have put us in those places to be your people. So help us and help us as we seek to um, lead and guide our churches that, that we might really see ourselves truly as sent and that we would be gathered authentically in your name and for your glory and that then we would be equipped to go out as dispatched people into the world to make a difference. That our, our churches might matter, not, not just for us, Lord, not mainly for us, but for you, that you would be glorified. And so we ask you to do within us more than all we can ask or imagine. Now, please guide this conversation. It may be helpful to these folks in the time we have remaining. In Christ's name, amen.